welcome everyone. Thanks for joining uh, Mr. With Spaces. Um, so as the name suggests, today we're going to be talking about identity that um, identity data that works for the users. Um, and as I mentioned, joined by Anka Banerjee, um, CTO and co-founder of Checked, um, Dominic Baron, uh, co-founder and CEO of Walt ID, and then Sanjeev uh, Rao, who's founder and CEO of Leap Wallet. Um, cool. So maybe before we kind of get stuck into it, maybe we could just have some brief introductions um, first to Dominic. Maybe if you could introduce yourself and just tell us a little bit about um, Walt. Sure. Uh, hey, it's Dom. Um, uh, excuse my voice. I'm, uh, I, I caught something, so I'm, I'm, I'm a bit sick fighting the flu, um, but I hope you can hear me okay. Yeah, we can. Yeah, we can. Perfect. Okay, awesome. Yeah, so I'm, I'm working on self-sovereign identity for a couple of years now. Um, starting 2018, um, then the following years helped the commission write the European SSI standards uh, in the course of the EBSI um, project, which some of you may know, the European Blockchain Service Infrastructure, uh, and then went on to found Walt ID. And we're basically building open source uh, identity infrastructure and wallet infrastructure, including both solutions for off-chain identity or mostly off-chain identity, so self-sovereign identity, as well as uh, different approaches for, let's say, on-chain identity, which is something I think we're going to be talking about too. So everything related to NFTs, SBTs, and so on and so forth. Cool. Thanks, Tom. Um, and Anki, maybe over to you. Yeah, sure thing. Uh, many of you might know me already, and good to see a lot of familiar faces as well as new ones. Uh, I'm the CTN co-founder at Checked. Uh, we've obviously been trying to build and have been in the process for the past two years, building out a network for giving people uh, control back of their data. And, and a large part of this, obviously, is working with partners like Vault ID, like Leap Wallet, as well as many, many others whom we have on our network, because uh, we're, we're not necessarily trying to build solutions ourselves for every single industry. Um, so yeah, no, that's, that's, that's it for me and, uh, super excited to dive into how identity can get more back in control of the users that they belong to. Brilliant. Thanks, Anka. And Sanjeev, you've timed that pretty per perfectly. So, um, over to you to do a quick introduction to yourself and Leap. Glad to finally be here after like 20 tries. <laughs> And just in time, like you said, but thanks so much, Ross and the rest of the Czech team for having us. Uh, so yeah, I'm Sanjeev, founder and uh, CEO here at Leap. So for those of uh, you not who don't know what Leap, we are a non-custodial crypto wallet that is currently solving for Cosmos. We currently support 45 plus Cosmos chains and I've been working very closely with Czech over the last like six to eight months. Um, natively support Czech across a bunch of our different wallet form factors and I'm sure we'll talk about that later on in the call. Uh, but identity as a concept has been extremely something that we've thought, we start thinking a fair bit about it. It is something that we think is going to be an integral aspect of wallets, uh, roadmaps, and how uh, how people manage and control their identities using wallets. So yeah, really excited to be here, share some of our learnings, and also learn uh, from some of the other folks here. Brilliant. All right. Thanks. Great to have you all here. Um, great. So let's get stuck in. So I think first up, like before we go like deep into things, I think we should all get onto the same page about like how do we actually define identity data or, or personal data um, so that we can understand how we can make it actually work for the user. So perhaps Anki, you could just like open up the conversation with kind of what do we mean when we're talking about personal um, and identity data? Absolutely. Uh, personal and identity data, I think especially when you talk about in the decentralized identity space or self-sovereign identity space, people often think of it as know your customer type information. Know your customer is what your bank or a crypto exchange asks you to do when they say, uh, show us a passport, show us a selfie, and then we let you join our system. Uh, but it's actually much broader than that. And the um, maybe maybe to sort of like, you know, describe it, it encompasses every kind of data that can be captured about a user. So for example, my browsing activity that could be monitored by an ad network, um, that's personal data, which they then use to serve and target ads with. Um, I perhaps have a reputation within the Telegram channel 
perhaps less so in being active these days, but I have a reputation of uh, responding to messages within the Czech Telegram channel or the Discord channel. Um, I might have a certain reputation as a developer um, and how good or not good I am when working with digital identity and Cosmos blockchains um, to take it like, so it, it sort of lies on a spectrum. So on, on one hand, you have things that are designated and often official. So um, parts of these are things like your passport, your driver's license, of course, uh, but also other things that could be awarded to you by public or private institutions. Good examples of these are maybe you have an employee pass, maybe you have a degree certificate from a university. Um, those are not necessarily issued by the government, but they could be uh, given to you by regulated industries. And on the other end of the spectrum, um, you have personal data that is of the type uh, which I described, which can be a bit bit less known or a bit less associated with you. So your activity uh, for a Cosmos wallet or any kind of crypto wallet, to be fair, um, online and whom you've been uh, sending or transferring money to, where have you been staking, um, your browsing activity, your uh, reputation on certain online forums uh, is also personal data. And the interesting thing is that some 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 of these, for example, when your browsing activity is tracked, or perhaps when you are uh, interacting with the wallet and buying expensive NFTs, or you're staking a certain amounts, that kind of data may not necessarily be known personally by you. Like it might not have your name uh, present, like front and center. Uh, but if somebody was able to correlate it back to you. Uh, they would be able to find out a fantastic amount of personal information about what do you like to spend money on? What do you like to spend your crypto on? Whom do you stake with? And so on. Uh, so I think it's a very broad and wide range, which is why uh, I think it's a very interesting topic to dive into. Quite often we focus a lot, uh, and I think people focus a lot on the regulated use cases, but I think on a day-to-day -day basis, we are perhaps... Uh, dealing with a much larger quantity of data uh, that is maybe not not to the same legal standard as a New York customer check. Yeah, thanks, Anka. Um, Dom, maybe any kind of thoughts you'd like to add on on that in terms of like defining it and and, and where confusion can sometimes lie. Uh, well, yeah, no, I, I think I completely agree with Anchor. I mean, what I hear often is that people understand digital identity or identity data very narrowly. I think that's what you also said, Ankur, with this narrow set of KYC information, like your name, your address. But at the end of the day, it can be everything about you. And if you understand it very broadly, it can even be things that you own that tell uh, others certain things about you, like to which community do you belong, right? Based on the tokens you hold or which types of concerts you like based on the tickets, tokenized tickets you own. So uh, I, I think this, this whole term of identity can be super broad and it also has to be understood that way to make sure that we get um, a full understanding of the richness of what it can be. Yeah, and I guess maybe building on that, like back to you, Dom, like I guess understanding what it is and like re removing that confusion, I guess it's good to then understand also if we're saying that we can build ident systems and ident that work for the user, what is it in its current form that it's like, why is it not working for the user? Oh, I see, yeah. So, I mean, as, as most people already know, there's this famous sentence that says, you know, the internet was built without an identity layer. It was also built without encryption and payments, but these things we kind of solved, more or less. Um, however, identity is still still a problem. And so and if you look at how identity works today, it's basically, <coughs> it works basically in that fashion that um, our identity is stuck with every app that we create an account with. Um, so all the applications we use have our accounts and our identity data is fragmented over these accounts and locked in so that we cannot really control them. What that means in practice is if I want to do something like Login with Google, which which I think everybody knows, I'm effectively telling an app to go and talk to Google for my data, 
which is uh, not at all user centric. And so there's a couple of new approaches, including self-sovereign identity that try to flip this around by actually giving users reusable credentials that are tamper proof um, that contain their identity data so that the user actually is in the middle of all their interactions and so that the user can actually control uh, which data they can present under which conditions uh, to which other party. And so I think regardless of which approach uh, we're going for, be it W3C verifiable credentials, be it MDOC speed, um, maybe other version, uh, other types of um, scenarios altogether, um, such as, you know, in the Web3 space, there's this recap standard that's being formulated uh, in combination with the sign with Ethereum standard. Um, all of these approaches, I think, try to give users more control over their data in a way that they actually control them in their own wallets. I hope that was helpful. Yeah, I think that defines it defines it pretty well, um, defines it really well. I guess um, kind of coming to Sanjeev, like we've kind of talked in that context around sort of self-sovereign identity and um, the kind of standards that Dominic mentioned there. Um, you're obviously in the kind of the wallet game within Cosmos space. So I guess for you, like what is the current, the kind of the status quo that you're trying to um, sort of battle against in terms of uh, with Leap? Yeah, for sure. That's a great question. I think that's the way we've sort of, uh, look at where the web the industry is specifically with regards to identity is that we are just starting to see the beginnings of how wallets might play a role in identity, how people even think about like a digital on-chain identity. Going back to some of the things that Ankur and Dom mentioned, uh, the way we, we think about like personal data and identity and the way they are actually different is that particularly in the context of blockchains, public blockchains that we are talking about, all of your data is fundamentally like actually available on chain it's public uh, and so the transaction that you do as Ankur mentioned where you stake the DeFi protocols that you interacted with all of this is already publicly out there of course it's not tied back to you and I think that's that is what really differentiates identity and and just your on-chain data the on-chain data is in this context analogous to personal data identity on the other hand is something that can be uniquely brought back and tied back to you so there are a few primitives that uh, people have started exploring in the last couple of years. And I think these are some things that we've also tried to lean into, integrate into our wallets. Uh, two, I think, particularly important ones are one, name services, which, of course, like ENS was the first uh, probably to like uh, kick this off in a big way. But we've also seen multiple examples in Cosmos. And again, mind you, there's different implementations of name services. And so that's where also you see that people think about name services, they associate name services to change in different ways. But that is an important part of people's identity. And that is something that you take with you across different Web3 applications. It's some, it's, it's a way for you to authenticate uh, yourselves. And so that I think is really important. The second thing that we are, we are starting to see is the whole idea of NFTs and what NFTs might represent um, as a part of your identity. And again, this can be in multiple different ways. These can be NFTs, uh, which indicate that you were at a particular event and in the form of POAPs. These could be NFTs, which are signaling your support for a particular creator, for a particular artist, which could also become, which could also be an important part of your identity, which is important in certain uh, Web3 applications. But yeah, broadly, I think these are two uh, name services and NFTs are two interesting applications we are seeing as of yet. Uh, and yeah, expect that there's going to be a lot more coming forward. Yeah, I guess, Anke, anything you want to touch on from what Sanjeev shared there, from our like, Cosmos experience and so forth? Yeah, I think the Ethereum name system thing is quite interesting. You'll see a lot of people on Twitter uh, actually change their handles quite often to uh, something.eth. Um, what's interesting, though, about that is essentially they are doxing themselves and, and revealing which sort of like in a wallet they primarily interact with. Um, but that's not to say that's all entirely bad. I think uh, the name systems that a lot of different chains have do make it simple and easy to use. Uh, it's obviously much simpler to remember um, that uh, someone's wallet address is vitalic.eth rather than trying to remember it's 0x blah, 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 like a very long set of alphabets and numbers. So I think they do play a role. 
Um, I think especially NFTs also do play a role uh, if they relate to something that gives you social status. So for example, if you have a very flashy car, um, a lot of people in crypto talk about <laughs> when Lambo. So if you have a Lambo, you probably want to show it off, right? Uh, so I think especially when it comes to things that perhaps accrue social status, I think uh, things that are stored on chain and on chain data is very, very powerful. What you might not want to as sort of uh, easily reveal to others unless they have asked for it is, are you currently employed or not? Do you currently have any health conditions or not? So I think it uh, again comes back to the spectrum thing. Um, some of these you might actually want to share on a case by case basis rather than to everybody who comes across. And there are others that you might actually want to display and, and, you know, it's okay to, uh, it, it's a, it's an acceptable sort of like, you know, compromise you're making. So I think what's interesting in this discussion is how quite often people think of this as just a binary when it's actually not. Yeah, for sure. Um, so yeah, I think that kind of like brings around us to the next point, which is, I guess, talking more around the solutions and like what, what's next. And I think um, there's different pieces that I want to put on this, both from like from all different um, groups here, from, from Czech, from Leap, and also from, um, from Dominic, from Walt. So maybe Dominic, to start with yourself, like, in your view, like, how can we make personal data more accessible and more user controlled? Yeah, sure. So um, I think there's there's really, let's say, at least three different components that we need for this. Um, number one are trust registries, which can be blockchains. And a good example of this would be checked. So these trust registries often serve as a single source of truth for things like or information about trusted issues, right? So that I can verify provenance or uh, schemas so that I can actually... Uh, verify the data models of uh, those digital identity documents themselves and so on. So they play a very important role. Um, they can also potentially be used to uh, build monetization into the whole thing, which is something you may want to talk about yourself or maybe Ankur want to say, wants to say a few words about it. But I think that's one very important component. Um, this is also what um, EBSI is trying to do, by the way, the European Blockchain Service Infrastructure. Uh, and then there's two other components. Uh, one are wallets, where I think we can distinguish identity wallets from crypto wallets, as there are still two distinct creatures. And the other components are components that a uh, business would run. Um, you could say enterprise infrastructure. Um, so in the context of self-sovereign identity, uh, which I think is today the most interesting uh, concept to talk about, um, you always have these three different parties. So you always have an issuer. So that's the, the data source. Let's say, for example, a university um, that has information about a student. Then you have the holder, that would be the student. Uh, and then you have a verifier, let's say, an employer or another university. And then what SSI does, uh, and these are also the components that um, the open source components that we are building, it enables the university to digitize, let's say, a diploma and uh, turn it into a so-called verifiable credential that is signed and then passed on to the user in their identity wallet. Uh, the user from their identity wallet uh, or holder, we could say, can then very easily uh, just pass this information along to uh, the employer or another university to prove that they actually obtain the diploma. Uh, and then in this course of the verification, the employer or university would obviously, you know, check back with the trust registry to make sure that provenance is ex actually legit. Um, but I think, so to sum up, uh, trust registries are super important. Wallet infrastructure is very important. And I'd be happy to discuss this also further. And then the third part of this are obviously the, let's say business side or enterprise infrastructure um, required to issue and verify identity information. Yeah, perfect. I think that was a great, great overview. And it kind of brings in like all of the different um, parties here as well. Maybe Anka, you just want to kind of come in there and talk through a little bit more about 
um, what uh, Don was kind of hinting at in terms of like trust registries and how Checked is um, like looking to support these going forward. Yeah, absolutely. I think at a very basic level, of course, um, it's about how can you trust this information that might not be on chain? I think that's a question that comes up quite often. Um, and to, to be honest, I think it, it seems simple when you think of something like an NFT, which has uh, some amount of information, but um, it also kind of needs to scale. For for example, a lot of people have been leaving Twitter maybe because Twitter Spaces doesn't work all the time as a product. And you decide, actually, I'm going to go across to the service called Mastodon, or uh, some people are building a new service called T2. You can't do that easily right now. And, and that's gigabytes of information. I recently did this. You can request the information that any company holds on you. Um, I did this just for my Apple profile, and it came out to about a couple of gigabytes of data that they that they had. And and so the, the challenge is that, like, you know, you can't necessarily store that on chain. That is too big to store on chain. So you need to figure out other mechanisms to understand if uh, this, this data has been tampered or not. Um, and to basically summarize, uh, partly you do that by storing some form of trust on chain. That's what Check does. Um, but I know, for example, Walt ID work with not just us, but a couple of other did methods as part of the... Uh, work they do with the European blockchain services infrastructure. Um, and you also have things like within our particular ecosystem, let's say within the Cosmoverse, uh, within the Cosmoverse, what are the different projects and what are the uh, things that I can trust from them if I come across a particular file or additional credential that has been issued by them. And so that's, that's sort of what a trust registry means. It's a way... Uh, or in our case, it's stored like on the check network, but obviously there are others. It's a mechanism through which you can check that some data that you've been presented is not been tampered and is actually truthful and therefore you can believe it. Brilliant. Yeah, thanks, Anka. I think that kind of touches a lot on the, the kind of the, the network side of things. I guess before we kind of come over to you, Sanjeev, um, from Leap's perspective, just one thing I wanted to kind of talk through more with Don was, um, around like the EU architecture and reference framework, maybe you could share like briefly like what this means and I guess what they're kind of is the legislating um, and how that's informed your product development. Uh, yeah, sure. Sorry, did did you ask me? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, just regarding like the yeah, EU uh, like, okay, yeah. architecture and reference framework. Oh yeah, yeah. That that's that's quite exciting. What's happening here? So this whole journey of identity wallet stuff. Uh, started on the commission level and I think around 2019 when I joined the project back then it was just about the European blockchain service infrastructure but word spread and so there's this new regulation and it's already quite far in the process called EIDAS2 and what it will do it will basically force the adoption of identity wallets for any sector across Europe and it will force large online platforms, banks, utility companies, and so on to accept wallet-based identity for authentication purposes and identification. That goes so far that you will be able to even open bank accounts with your identity wallet. And so it, this is even actually mentioned in the new anti-money laundering regulation which is quite exciting because the AML regulated use cases are obviously the ones that are hardest to implement. Um, and so um, that's the exciting news, I think. Uh, Wallet-centric identity is coming to Europe and it will, will be coming for all kinds of use cases supported by the government. Um, the, I don't want to say downside, but the, the downside of it is that it is... Um, not a completely decentralized, or let's say a, a system that is less decentralized than let's say a system you would build on top of a public permissionless ledger, for example. Um, but at the end of the day, um, if we look at identity, um, especially self-sovereign identity, then you see more and more ecosystems emerge. And you see that all of these ecosystems have slightly different approaches. Some of them are more open and decentralized. Some of them are more closed and centralized. And so 
the European system will not be based on a blockchain, but it will include verifiable credentials and MDOCs based on the ISO standard, and it will include a wallet so that the user will be um, the actual intermediary um, between uh, a verifier, to stay stick with the terms I used before. Um, and so I think that's quite exciting that we get a user-centric identity mm -hmm. model um, into Europe. And I think for everything outside of the use cases that are supported by the EUID wallet, that's the official name, um, you will still be able to use, you know, other more decentralized identity approaches. So it's like something that com complements each other. Yeah, no, that's really helpful. And um, I was talking with Anker and actually one of our colleagues, Alex, earlier about kind of AIDES. And um, one of the things that Anker shared was um, DocuSign as a good case study. And I think it's quite helpful, like for people kind of more new to the space to kind of use this as a case study because... I mean, you can chip in more if I if I get any of this wrong, but DocuSign is basically kind of a case study of what EADAS enabled and DocuSign came to exist because of it, essentially because um, EADAS basically regulated the use of digital signatures to be used um, and that enabled e-signing. Um, and although currently using like more centralized technologies, it basically means that like we see products at the scale and size of DocuSign come to exist. And I guess you can think this like EADAS v2 could essentially kind of birth the start of companies on the same scale as DocuSign um maybe Anki I mean that was your point I've stolen there because I, th I found it really helpful for contextualizing it yeah and um maybe Dom you can join up after this but obviously the the traditional way of things is somebody comes up to you with a paper and they get what is called a wet signature as they say um obviously a lot of these things happen online these days uh, but you still need to sign like, you know, documents for a lot of these contracts to be valid. And something that's like, you know, radically transformed business is the fact that you can do that digitally these days. And that's taken a lot of like, you know, legal work to make happen. Uh, it's, it's not necessarily a given that you can consider a digitally signed signature to be valid. So the previous generation, and I think that's that's a huge leap in itself, is the fact that you can sign these documents digitally. Uh, obviously that relies on DocuSign still being around as a company or as a centralized service, having access to all of this data. Or uh, if you wanted to check that something is valid, you, you're you relying on DocuSign. Um, what, what, this, what these sort of like, you know, de decentralized ID technology and allows is, how can you expand beyond that? How can you perhaps sign maybe a DeFi loan and, and consider to, that to be a valid signature while taking your credit score into account um, in a sort of uh, decentralized fashion and, and without relying on these centralized credit bureaus that exist. So I think that's quite interesting. Um, it, it, it could also enable the fact that this evolution that we're seeing within European Union um, brings across a whole range of like you know, new services. Um, Dom, I don't know if like, you know, you want to add something here because I don't know if I completely butchered the AI at this point. <laughs> you, you're obviously way closer to the European Union than I am, given the FT work that you do. So over to you. Yeah, no, that, that, that's completely right. That's actually something I didn't say, that there is also an AI uh, version one, and it enables signatures. And so the, the thing is, I mean, you could even today uh, use EIDA signatures as a EU citizen to log into services. The problem is the way this whole system was designed and built uh, is that it got quite some additional traction during COVID in some countries, but since it's slightly different in most of the countries, and since you have a fragmentation of so-called trust services across different countries with different centralized systems that don't really work well together, you cannot really use this outside of the public sector. So in Austria, for example, where I'm from, we have a quite good system so that I can use this to log into all kinds of government services, but I can't use it for the private sector. And so EIDAS2 yeah, is now this, on the one hand, extension that goes beyond the signature, which allows me to prove more things than basically authenticating myself towards service. I can now also show, you know, my name, my age, these kinds of things. 
And on the other hand, the whole goal is that um, this this system becomes usable also um, across different sectors as well as in the private in the private area. Uh, and so, yeah, let's see how that goes. Um, but it's really just an extension of a legal framework that we already have. Perfect. Yeah, that's uh, wrapped it up well. I think we'll we'll come back back to kind of like what this means in terms of like checked and walked um, in a bit. I guess moving over to Sanjeev now. Like now we've been talking a bit around kind of like solutions. Um, how does Leap intend to solve problems? Um, you know, of users kind of being able to have a more user centric and user controlled future around their identity data. Like, what does Leap do in that context? Sure. I think uh, what I can do, Ross, is maybe break this up into uh, into like sort of two uh, two parts, which also sort of roughly map out the two timelines in our partnership with with Check. So when we first started talking to uh, to Check six eight months back, we realized that for all of this to happen, Check is obviously solving a very important problem. First and foremost, it was important that different stakeholders of the Czech ecosystem, which include uh, validators, include delegators, people who want to participate in governance uh, voting, they need to have an easy interface. They need to have a great wallet that lets them access these capabilities. And so to that end, a lot of our work and partnership with Czech in the, in the period so far has gone on providing native support for Czech across all our products. So as it stands today, uh, across our browser extension, both our mobile apps, our web dashboard, you have native support integrated for Check, which means uh, you can actually stake the Check token, you can participate in governance, read proposals, actually vote on Check. You can actually, uh, as a user, go and browse all of your historical activity uh, on the wallet itself. You can actually connect uh, to the wallet using a different range of methods, including Ledger as well. So this was sort of our our initial uh, sort of uh, roadmap here was ensuring that Checked as an infrastructure layer, Checked as a network, has all it needs to interface with its different stakeholders. And I think we have sort of, we've, we've at a point where we've built out most of the core features uh, in this regard. So that was like phase one. Phase two is now we're starting to think about wall identity uh, from an end user perspective, like what are the features, what are the different workflows for identity, and how can we sort of participate in that. And so in terms of firstly, how we would frame this problem, like wallets itself, as, as, as it's sort of a commonly understood right now, people think about wallets as a passport to Web3. They are essentially the interface between users and the blockchain. Uh, and so they are well primed to sort of solve for identity. But even within that, the specific approach uh, positioning that Leap has taken is that we call ourselves a super wallet. And that's, that's been our branding from the very beginning, which is that uh, taking this idea a little bit further of interfacing between users and the blockchain, we want Leap and our products uh, to be that single place where users can go and interact with any applications that are built on the blockchain. Right? And, and some of the things I've spoken around being able to stake, being able to vote, being able to see your activity all to one product is the beginning of it. But beyond that, we want people to be able to interact with DeFi apps, be able to buy NFTs, be able to authenticate games and do a whole bunch of things to our products. And so this framework, I think, also extends very well to identity. Um, and again, there's maybe different parts of it which we can quickly touch upon. And again, these are ideas. Uh, these are still like, you know, things which we are uh, in early discussions with and would love to like, you know, see some proof of concepts implemented over the year. But let's say you, you think through an identity sort of journey the first part of it would be, as a user, how are you actually receiving, how are you interfacing with somebody who's going to issue your identity? And I think maybe Dom was the one who mentioned this example of university and actually receiving your degree. Now, we imagine a future where uh, this th th this whole thing, right, the whole idea of being able to receive uh, your identity, this is deployed as an application on the blockchain that we support. And so as a user, this whole process of communicating with the issuer, being able to maybe uh, receive QR codes at this end, being able to like uh, actually go through the entire process and make sure that you make the payment that you need to to receive the identity. All of that happens through the wallet itself, right? So you don't have to juggle between 10 different applications. Uh, you might have different requirements for identity across different use cases in your life. All of that is potentially happening from the wallet layer, right? So that's the aspect about how do you build your identity. Then second aspect, I think that's really important, especially in, in this digital Web3 context, is that there's no one definition 
of identity and so there's this whole idea of you potentially having multiple profiles having different identities which are relevant in different contexts and that's something i think that we definitely would want to support in the form of let's say as a as a leap user you have different wallets and on these different wallets are different profiles right so let's say you might have a gaming profile which has certain nfts which has certain credentials which are relevant to you when you are actually going to play different games uh, but that is a, is probably not the profile that you want to share with a potential employer right so there you're going to have a different set of nfts you might have a uh, different set of credentials there which are referring to your degrees things that you've studied work that you've done and so i think wallets as that layer where users can go manage and set their uh, set different versions or different profiles of their identity is the second uh, area that we want to focus on and then finally comes to the actual application layer itself right like ultimately you're building these um, identity to to be able to use them in applications and so again we imagine that these end applications will also be deployed and be accessible from the wallet and so that sort of neatly ties in the third and final cycle of why you're actually trying to build these identity thanks sanjeev i think that was a great a great overview of it and um yeah it's cool to see kind of how you're stepping up the kind of engagement and interest in um in ssi and obviously like we're excited by the partnership as well so um yeah thanks for that i guess like a question that uh many of our community may have um and one you probably get pitched a lot at is um obviously kepler is one of the dominant wallets within um, the cosmos ecosystem just as a quick kind of overview like how do you kind of um differentiate it differentiate yourselves from from kepler as a wallet and in terms of your roadmap and so forth yeah great question and yeah definitely something we get a fair bit so i think in in terms of uh the first and most important thing as i was alluding to earlier we actually have added native support for check and actually 45 other cosmos chains in our wallet which is very different from kepler where there are a select set of chains that are natively supported and you can actually access other chains but you go through this weird suggest chain workflow which is not great for the chain which is not great for the users and so our approach has been to actually partner with individual chains and ensure that like you know we natively uh, support these wallets which mean we do extensive testing across uh, all of our different form factors to make sure all of the capabilities are working that they should um, and i think that's actually been one of our biggest differentiators in building trust with these chains and building trust with their communities and an extension of that is that the way we imagine wallet capabilities also is you have a core set of features which are common to all cosmos chains but then there are uh, different nuances there are different like you know features that we'd like to partner with individual chains on so we've done things like uh, with certain chains we've actually integrated faucets into the wallet with certain chains that have different ledger apps we've actually integrated that and i think with checked i imagine that we'd be doing a lot of uh, custom work to support identity and like you know check features so that's sort of like one area of differentiation the second thing for us is that we do have a uh, sort of a hyper focus on ux improvements where we see that there are a lot of capabilities which might be present in other cosmos wallets but it requires uh, it requires a lot of technical understanding uh, it requires uh, digging deep into like you know certain blockchain concept which we think the average user shouldn't have to do right so a good example is something like ibc transfers which is an important uh, transaction type but if you try doing it through a typical cosmos wallet you have to figure out what channel ids are you have to figure out how ibc transfers work but in leap we've completely abstracted all of that out and just made ibc transfers one click right and that that's a sort of focus on ux we try to uh, have across the board and finally i think one important thing that we'll see uh, going forward is that mobile support for wallet is going to be really important uh, that is something that we also have a lot of focus on which is making sure that our mobile wallets are fully feature spec Uh, in fact we imagine a world where new features new developments will first happen on mobile wallets as opposed to browser extensions which is exactly the opposite of how it works today uh and we we continue to build features there so for example we recently launched uh this capability of allowing users to permissionlessly access any dapps through their in-app browser so now any dapp across any cosmos chain can be permissionlessly accessed on the go right whether it's defi nfts or otherwise So yeah I think this sort of sums up uh, some of the some of some of our focus areas and differentiators from Kepler. Yeah, no, thanks Sanjeev. I think it's amazing how kind of I mean you're right in terms of Leap being like a super wallet like the amount of different features that you can do within wallet in terms of governance staking the kind of the how intuitive it is for a user who maybe is less familiar it's got a lot within it like 
considering you're just going to kind of like an extension, the amount of um, the, how feature rich it is for an extension, I think is really powerful. So if you're not already using Leap, I'd like go suggest checking it out. It's um it's a really kind of good app. And as, as we kind of said, it's obviously um, we're checked as completely supported in there and you can stake and delegate and so forth. Um, cool. So I think just like rounding back to Anchor, we've talked a bit about kind of wallets um, from both kind of the, the wallet ID perspective and from, um, from Leap as well. So Anchor, maybe you could just touch a bit on kind of like how important and what role do crypto wallets play, uh, sorry, identity wallets play within decentralized identity and how are the standards around wallets evolving? Absolutely. And I think Sanjeev made a really, really good point about supporting uh, desktop as well as mobile. Uh, I think this is one of those areas where there's a, quite a distinction between the approach that the decentralized identity space has taken and the what, what happens generally in crypto. So as Sanjeev said, it's very common in crypto that a lot of websites, a lot of experiences only work using a desktop browser browser wallet or browser extension. Uh, that to me is insane. Like there's, uh, uh, for practically everything else, I can do and, and order things on my phone. And often a lot of Web2 companies build stuff as a mobile first experience. So I think the kind of focus that, that Sanjeev was talking about, about supporting these as native first party experiences that are really rich, is, is something that like, you know, is very lacking in the crypto world. I think on the other hand, uh, my sort of like experience, and um, we can go to Dom as well on, on thoughts is on the identity wallet side on, on SSI wallets and so on. It's much more common that the experience is mobile only uh, because uh, sometimes it's because of technical limitations. Sometimes it's because they're building for mobile first, I'm not saying this is necessarily true of Vault ID, a uh, lot of the work that they do is, is pretty across different uh, spectrums. But I think it is not uncommon to hear about SSI wallets that only work on mobile and do not work on desktop, uh, which again, I think is problematic because uh, if, for example, I have to have a mobile like you know, next to me always to interact, then that's not necessarily great I either. Uh, I think the future direction or the future that sort of like, you know, lies over here is um, it's very uncommon for people to download a new application. The the barrier to entry of convincing somebody to download something new is very, very, very high. Um, and one of the areas that we've been thinking about is, yes, there will be dedicated identity wallets or identity folders or um, means of interaction that work on both mobile and desktop. But what I think could be really cool is the fact that there's already a huge, huge install population of people who have crypto wallets, whether that be as a browser extension or on mobile. And quite often when we're interacting with Web3 or Web2 services, if you're saying the internet never had an identity layer, uh, one, of the, one of the key ways in I think this sort of adoption can be achieved is if there was a technical standard or a way for crypto wallets to natively support digital identity or SSI credentials the of the kind that we are building. Um, and I think that could make very rich and compelling resources because you're obviously trying to provide your identity because maybe you're trying to do an IBC transfer or a DEX transfer. Uh, but before that, you might wanna check, before I buy this NFT, am I transferring my tokens are to a, to a legitimate website or a legitimate NFT marketplace? Am I perhaps interacting with the right ENS address or now a lookalike ENS address? I think that's where it becomes quite compelling. Uh, I think there's benefits obviously in the uh, identity wallet space as well. If identity wallets are also equally able to support a lot of these Web3 experiences, uh, I think there's there's a lot of overlap and it will make those possible, make those experiences possible both across desktop and mobile. Dom, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Uh, maybe Dom, you first on, on your thoughts around like, you know, I think it's, 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 it's an idea that we've obviously been talking about on how there's such a huge user base of crypto wallets already. And I think obviously there, there's obviously a space for identity wallets, but they can live, live as SDKs within crypto wallets because that's what 
that's the kind of experience people already have on their phone. Yeah, it's a great question. So how, how will that work? So as, as you stated, um, many people building identity wallets are building mobile apps first. And that, since we talked a lot about the, the European Union and the IDAS2, that will also be the case with UID wallets. Those will also be mobile apps, not browser extensions. Um, the way we approach this is we've never built a mobile app um, simply because we're infrastructure dev tooling people. Um, and so we, we never wanted to get distracted by having to care about the user interface and mobile app development for different platforms. So the way we build our identity wallet uh, is to basically, um, you know, build it in a way that it could extend all kinds of applications with identity capabilities. So that can be an online banking app. We just recently did a um, project with a, with a large bank where the idea was to enable the online banking app, not only to manage fiat money, but also, you know, crypto assets as well as identity data. Um, but then again, um, the same should be then true for any other type of application like crypto wallets. Um, and so um, I also believe that at the end of the day, there will be many different ways of doing identity. Um, I think you will be uh, able to use more complex approaches like self-sovereign identity or MDOCs that require um, quite complex authentication protocols like OpenID Connect, which just add a lot of complexity to wallets or would add a lot of complexity to wallets. Um, then there's this other standard I mentioned before for recaps where the whole idea is that when you sign a transaction to authenticate yourself towards an app, for example, based on the sign with Ethereum standard, you could provide a debt with authorizations to access data that lies somewhere else in some kind of personal data vault. So this is obviously a much simpler uh, approach of doing this. However, it's less standardized and has as a consequence, uh, no comparable traction so far. Um, but I think it will be really be crucial to figure out how crypto wallets and identity wallets fit together. And the last thing I'm gonna say is uh, I've been to ETH Denver and the biggest or one of the biggest topics obviously was user onboarding as well as account abstraction. Uh, and so I think smart contract wallets will be super important. And then it will be very interesting to figure out how uh, identity will play into the whole abstraction that will, um, that will um, happen to crypto wallets to provide a better user experience. And I'm curious what, actually, the, what, what the others think, including Sanjeev. Yeah, actually, just Dom, to piggyback off the back of that, I think you've touched upon a very important point there, that there's a lot of complex stuff that's happening in the traditional Web, web 2 world. And while we are in transition, I think that's where the kind of approach that you guys are taking at Vault ID, uh, where you're building these bridges between the traditional open ID connect OAuth web two type identity systems as well as web three based identity systems uh, I think that's very crucial and I think that is also uh, the, the abstracts away complexity from crypto wallets necessarily getting scope creep and having to start dealing with web two identity I think the big sort of like innovation here um, correct me if I'm wrong is that you allow users to perhaps have not not necessarily need to download like 10 different apps, for example. <laughs> um, and I think some of the work that you guys have been doing on build, bridging these two different worlds of Web 2 and Web 3 is, is quite crucial to keep the complexity low for crypto wallets um, as well. Yeah, I think just anchor on while we're on this point and then we'll come to, to more so to chat um, to Sanjeev. I think um, it's interesting if we could maybe just talk to a little bit around kind of like the, the partnership between um, Check and Vault ID. Um, Dom, you mentioned like Open ID verifiable credentials and presentations. Maybe Anki, you could just speak to a little bit around kind of how we're working with Vault and what we're building into our um, tech stack and also more broadly what that means for kind of um, adoption. Sure. I mean, we've had a very um, sort of open-ended view that if you're talking about interoperable Web3 or Web2 identity, the reality is that people would want to 
people people will still have the login with Google, login with Facebook, and login with traditional ID systems. Um, if you can convince them to come over to Web3 experiences, that's great. Uh, but in the interim, there will at least be an overlap between the different experiences. So uh, one of the very crucial like you know, bits that we've been working on with Vault ID, given the fantastic sort of coverage they have, is to, to build essentially these bridges that allow uh, A, the, the checked uh, Web3 identity experience to be used uh, within identity applications on desktop, web app, mobile, et cetera, et cetera, but also uh, then be able to, within those same experiences with the same toolkit, be able to handle traditional ID as well. Uh, so maybe Dom and then Sanjeev, like next on like this whole like crypto sort of idea. <laughs> Dom, do you want to like add anything to that? No, not, not at the moment. I'd, I'd be curious to hear Sanjeev's perspective and then maybe I can add something more. Yeah, I think uh, jumping in real quick, I think a, a, a range of like interesting points mentioned by Ankur and, and Dominic, but maybe one if I would want to double click on as, as something that we also think a lot about is this whole aspect, Dom, you mentioned around onboarding um, and what we can do as wallet builders to make that easy. Because essentially the way uh, we look at it is that in the current framework, we have done as much as we think we can in terms of allowing people to uh, use Leap using a private key, using the seed phrase, using ledger apps. But yeah, at the end of the day, we realize that this is still for fairly advanced, for fairly like crypto native users. And if we're really thinking about like identity applications that can span to millions and billions of users, uh, the onboarding into Web3 or, or more like, you know, I'd, I'd even call it like abstraction from Web3, right? People don't even need to know that this is Web3 behind the scenes. That actually needs to happen. And so that is something that is going to be an important part of our roadmap towards the second part of the year. Uh, it's something we've already started thinking about doing some proof of concepts around. So for example, uh, something we're trying to do is work with Web3 auth uh, and see if users can have like a social login based approach where they can log in using, let's say, a Google login or a Twitter sign-in and still be able to access wallet capabilities. Um, the other thing Dom mentioned around account abstraction, I don't think has really been explored in Cosmos. So that's something we do want to spend a lot of our uh, time on in the second part of the year. But essentially, we also think about this as like, you know, very far, over and above everything we discussed in terms of what wallets can do from an identity perspective. This is an extremely important like infra uh, side that we'll have to solve if we really want to get this uh, mass adoption. Yeah, and anything you'd like to build on that? No, I think I think we covered all of the ground. And um, I think especially with the kind of uh, mentality and approach that, that Leap has with, with that, uh, we were just joking earlier about the everything app and Elon Musk. Uh, but fundamentally, that's to an extent, the everything app for identity. Uh, there's there's a lot of like you know work that is still to be done, but I think last year and this year there's been a lot of recognition that this is a problem that needs to be solved in the Web three space. So I'm I'm very like you know excited that we've got this bunch of people that we have over here uh, working with us on making that possible. Yeah. And um, yeah, for those that are kind of interested, we'll be sharing a, a blog later this week, or early next week, just to go into more detail about kind of our partnership with Walt and, and how we're kind of building um, open ID verifiable credentials and presentations into the checked um, stack, which will kind of enable more options for people, more interoperability um, and so forth, as Anne and Don both kind of commented on. Um, cool. I think we're coming to the end here. There was one final topic that we did want to cover. So if we've got a couple more minutes, I'd be interested in just like coming to um, kind of having a discussion around NFTs, particularly because so many people are like familiar with NFTs and there's very different, you know, there's some similarities and there's some big differences between NFTs and, and verifiable credentials. Um, one for kind of Dom, like what idea has done a lot of work on the NFT infrastructure space? Um, so what role do you feel NFTs have within decentralized ID? Uh, um, and if, so the way we 
a year, I think roughly a year back, we published a white paper on this and we said identity is, is who you are and the NFTs are about what you own. And so for us, those are two complement, two complementary things and two completely different creatures. At the end of the day, um, you have, let's say, at least four different areas in which those two approaches, SSI versus NFTs, have uh, behaved very differently, which are privacy, scalability, costs, and uh, compliance. And uh, in, in that sense, you know, I think NFTs are great if you have use cases like ticketing where you want to have a, a tradable access right where you want to be able to resell rent or uh, do, do anything in, in this regard and, and where access to a specific service or product is not dependent on who you are but just who owns this this ticket right or this 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 token i think this is where where everything around nfts is very exciting uh, and then obviously there's lots of, let's say, on-chain identity projects that are popping up, which are built on uh, NFTs. We talked about ENS. Many of you are probably also familiar with Lens Protocol. Um, so NFTs are becoming a core building block, not only for tokenizing assets in general, but also for tokenizing assets that can be used in the identity context. Uh, however, if you want to build use cases where it's really about your personal information, you can obviously not use NFTs, um, especially not for compliance reasons if you have customers in the European Union. And so in this regard, uh, you, will, you will have to use uh, verifiable credentials or let's say uh, simply approaches where all the information is really kept off chain. And in best case scenario, not even not even an identifier is kept on chain. So we, where you have more peer-to-peer -peer, uh, key distribution mechanisms in place, um, I'd say yeah, that's the that's the short answer. Thanks, Dom. Um, sorry, and Sanjeev, I, I appreciate you've you've actually got to go. So Sanjeev, please please feel free to kind of leave a final message on your thoughts um, and anything you'd like to kind of share before you before you drop off, and then we'll we'll wrap up shortly after. Yeah, firstly, apologies. I have to drop off. Would love, would love to stay. Great conversation, but do have uh, another thing to get to. Uh, was really amazing being here. I think a bunch of great questions and, and like, you know, uh, great insights from Ankur and Dom. That's, that's also going to uh, be factored into our roadmap and the way we think about identity. But I guess that the, the most important thing that I'd like to leave the audience with here is that this is, this is still a very new and evolving space, even for us. Like so far, uh, even from Leaf's perspective, a lot of our focus has been on DeFi, NFTs. We are still at the start of uh, identity and thinking about identity and what we do here. So for people listening in here, if they might be developers or end users who are looking at different identity applications, we'd love to chat. So you could feel free to reach out to me personally or to our team on Discord, Telegram, Twitter, anywhere. We're, we're present across all these channels. But we'd love to hear about what are use cases, some use cases you have in mind. What are some challenges that you face on on this front? Again, it can be identity or outside of that as well. But we love to like uh, stay close to our community, hear about your feedback, and uh, build our roadmap accordingly. So yeah, if there's anything at all, we'd absolutely love to chat with you. But other than that, it's been amazing uh, being in the space. Thank you so much, Ra, Sankur, Dominic, and look forward to doing this soon again. Thanks a lot, Sanji, for joining. Yeah, really appreciate you being here and looking forward to, to much more happenings with, with Leap and Checked over the coming months. Um, I think we've lost Dom or he's been pushed to the audience. So, um, Dom, I've just invited you back up to the stage. Um, so, Anki, yeah, I mean, just to kind of wrap up here, maybe you could just like comment on um, your kind of beliefs around NFTs and how they kind of play into decentralized identity and perhaps some of the risks around NFTs within identity. I think we might have covered that already. I'm conscious of time as well. Uh, but like the basic answer is it's, um, well, I guess this is a very European audience, so I don't know how much this makes sense. But if you've heard of an application called Venmo, which is really popular in the US, it has a public, it's a way to transfer money between different people. Um, and usually like the, the every single transaction is public by default. Um, or used to be, I don't know what it is these days. Uh, and because of that, uh, if anybody mm -hmm. was able to find your public profile, you would then be able to see what they've been spending the money on. So 
I think that's the that's the challenge or like you know how I spoke earlier there are some kinds of use cases where you might want to show that off uh, where whereas there are others where you probably want to keep it private and so I think there's a space for both to coexist and uh, we are really trying to capture the space where um where you perhaps want to have some more control on when and what you want to share Brilliant. Thanks, Anka. And yeah, we have definitely come to time. Dom, if you want to like leave a kind of a final word before you jump off and um, yeah, we'll, we'll wrap things up here. And So over to you, Dom. Oh, yeah, thanks. No, it was was uh, fun today. So looking forward to the next time. If anybody's interested in learning more about what, what we do, you can find us on Twitter. Uh, we have a Discord. You can find our website. Um, it's it's walt.id. Easy to find. Um, feel free to get in touch if you have any questions. Apart from this, I'll give it back to you, Ross and Ankur. Thanks for organizing. Thanks for hosting. It was it was a really cool chat. Thanks, guys. Brilliant. Thanks, Thanks so Dominic. And yeah, like we said, we'll be sharing um, kind of some more information later this week with our with our partnership with Walt. Um, Ankur, over to you, and then feel free to to wrap up. No, all good. Unless there are any questions, happy to take them. Otherwise, Dom, nice to. Uh, to chat with you again and hopefully you get better soon brilliant thanks very much guys thanks everyone for joining